My topic today is the book of Nehemiah. Please turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. Nehemiah. As we continue to look at this process that Israel was involved in rebuilding their temple. Now in the 11th verse of chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we're told about how this man came to Jerusalem. We're told about what he saw there, and he challenged the people to do. Verse 11, or chap verse 11 of chapter 2. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the shepherd, the serpent well, and the refuge gate, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley, and I viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in? How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. God's people, the children of Israel, were able to return to their homeland. But when they came, they found desolation. The temple had been destroyed. The gates, the walls of the city had been torn down. And the gates had been burned. Let me just say that in 536 B.C., there were over 42,000 Jews who came back under Zerubbabel. 42,000. Eighty years later, Ezra. Now, of course, we have the book of Ezra. And we have the book of Nehemiah. Eighty years after Zerubbabel came with 42,000, Ezra brought back around 5,000 Jews to rebuild the city. And then finally, 13 years later, in 445 B.C., a man named Nehemiah brought another group, just a small group, which he brought back to the land. Now, we're talking about rebuilding. We're talking about rebuilding the kingdom of God, the people of God. And all of us are building something. We're either building well or we're tearing down. You know, I've always noticed that it's much easier to tear down something than it is to build up something. Have you ever seen one of these big wrecking crews tear down a building? Just recently, a coliseum or a stadium down in Philadelphia was torn down. 
And they did it in just a few days, really. Literally years to build that great stadium. To build churches takes time, a lot of prayer. To build families takes time, energy, and effort. And yet the sad thing is a family can be torn up by one stupid choice. The church can be destroyed very easily by carping critics and by people who are determined to tear it down. A life can be destroyed. Nations can be destroyed when people are not praying and not seeking the will of the Lord. And so I ask you today as we think about this, are you building or are you tearing down? Are you trying to build up your home? Are you trying to build up your wife, your husband? Are you encouraging that person? Or are you tearing them down? What about our nation? Are you praying for our nation? Are you praying for our leaders, our president, Congress, our local leaders? Or are you destructive? Our nation could fall, just as Israel fell. Now, you have here on the... Uh, screen, perhaps you can't read it, the three migrations back to Israel. And we're looking today at the career of Nehemiah, and also we have some information about Ezra the scribe. Nehemiah is a remarkable character. He was a patriot. He was compassionate. He was determined, and he was a very wise man. And God laid it on his heart to leave a very important, comfortable position in Babylon. To go back to Jerusalem in a rather discouraging and difficult situation. In a dangerous situation. To take in hand the task of restoring this nation to what it was. Many students of the book of Nehemiah, for example, Chuck Swindoll, who has written on this, recognize that this is a great book about leadership. The kind of leaders we need in the nation, in the church, and in families. It's a book about courage, determination, discipline, but also discouragement. And so we're talking about rebuilding the kingdom of God. And I hope you will be a builder, not a destructive person. Now, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king of Persia. He had a comfortable position back there in the land of his exile. For all I can see, the cupbearer of the king was a person who enjoyed many privileges. He lived, no doubt, in fine facilities. He had all that he wanted as he served the king. Day after day, Nehemiah went into the king with his wine and with his drinks and with his food. This was a very comfortable place to be. But God called Nehemiah to leave his comfort zone and go do the difficult things. I wonder how many of us would be willing to leave our comfort zone to do something risky for the Lord. Supposing God laid it on your heart to be a soldier and to enlist in the armed forces, as many young men are doing now in spite of all the problems in Iraq. You know it's dangerous there. You know it's difficult there. But these heroes of ours are protecting freedom for us and are trying to bring safety and freedom to people far away. Pray about that. Pray about doing something difficult. 
if God calls you to do it. Well, my first point today is that as Nehemiah is in the court of the king of Persia, far away from his homeland, he begins to worry. Yes, that's right. We're described in the book of Nehemiah how that although he had all these comforts, although he had all these blessings and advantages, he was sad. And the king of Persia noticed that he was sad. He was sad because far away, something very precious to him was in jeopardy. He was not content to enjoy the pleasures of the court for thinking about the terrible condition of his homeland. He was a patriot. He loved the nation of Israel. He loved Jerusalem. And he had heard reports about the terrible conditions there. Folk had come to him and said, Nehemiah, do you know what's going on in Israel? Do you know that the walls have fallen? The temple is destroyed? The people are hungry? They've burned the gates? The enemies of God are going through the land? And this touched his heart. He was not content to just enjoy the pleasures of Persia. Now this shows a heart that's public spirited. That's patriotic. You know, as I look at our congregation and as I look at you folk today, as you've come out to church, I suspect that many of you as far as material things, are blessed. You live in a nice house in all probability. You, you have a car, you probably have two cars. You have plenty of food to eat. But I ask you today, can you be content with these material blessings? Can you be content with these physical blessings if you know our country is in danger? Or if you know there's a serious need in your family, if there's someone in your family that's straying, or can you be content to just enjoy your food and your beautiful bed and your television and your recreations? If spiritually speaking there is a need for revival, Oh, I know we shouldn't worry. But the kind of worrying that Nehemiah did is something that could lead to action. Let's say he was concerned. And so he began to pray. He sought the Lord. He had a job in Persia. He was in the palace of the king, but his heart was far away. And so one day as he comes before the king of Persia, and obviously the king is trying to please him. He's a good servant. He's a friend. He's been faithful. But the king looks at Nehemiah and he sees a long face. He sees that he's sad. And so he says to him, What's wrong? Why are you so unhappy? And so this patriot this man of God, this Jew, says, how can I be happy? When my city is in ruins, when my homeland is destroyed, when the walls of the city that I love have been torn down by enemies. And so, he asked permission of the king to go back. To leave his comfort zone. To leave his conveniences. And his pleasures. And his job, if you will. To go back to Jerusalem. And so, he gets permission from the king not only to leave, 
but the king of Persia who controls that whole region of the world with all of its provinces and the various governors of those provinces. He gets permission for Nehemiah to go back, so he's escorted back to Jerusalem. He comes in the middle of the night, and what he sees breaks his heart. For he sees the situation is even worse than he had suspected. With a few good men, it says, in chapter 2, verse 12. Let's look at it. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. Now, as I read this, I thought maybe Nehemiah was the one who founded the Marines. Because it says he took a few good men with him. And I believe the Marines are looking for a few good men. You know, really, all we need is a few good men. I don't know how many we'll have out for our uh, breakfast on Saturday, but I hope you men will sign up and come. We always have a good time together. The food is good. There's good fellowship and a good message. But we want to build fellowship among the men of the church as well as the ladies in the church to pull together and to strive together to change our community, to change our church, to change our lives, to change our families. Yes, to change our nation. I ask you today, think about this. Will the world be a better place because you were here or a worse place? Will you be remembered as someone who built or who tore down? Will you be remembered for angry words, ungodly words, curse words? Or will you be remembered as someone who taught little children, who set an example? who put your hand to the plow for the kingdom of God. Yes, Nehemiah came with a few good men, and his heart broke when he saw the desolation of Jerusalem. Can you be content? Can you be indifferent when you hear the things that are happening in our great land of America, when you see families broken up, when you see the Christian faith being denied, doesn't it touch your heart? Doesn't it break your heart? You ought to weep when you hear of people choosing to go against God. Well, Nehemiah transferred his worry, if you will, or his concern into action. Now, here is where so many of us fail. We are armchair critics. We sit by our televisions and we know the answers to the various problems of the world. We know what the Supreme Court did that was wrong. We know what Congress did that was wrong. We, knew, we know what people on the streets do that are wrong in Sunbury or Lewisburg or Sealands Grove. But we never do anything about it. All we do is just boil up with anger and spew out our criticisms. But Nehemiah was a man of action. He said, I'm going to get involved. And he knew when he did that, he knew when he made that decision, he was going to face opposition. In chapter 2, verse 17, here's what it says. He said to that handful of people who'd gone with him, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build 
the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Do you like it when your family's reputation is being tarnished by someone who's living sinfully? Do you like it when a leader in the community scandalizes his name and his position? Do you like it? I hope not. Well, Nehemiah was not happy with the reproach of Jerusalem. And so he says, let's build. Let's build. Let's do something. Let's don't just complain. Let's build. I don't know that Nehemiah wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a prophet. He was just, a, I guess you'd say, an ordinary person who had a job back in Persia. But he was determined. I don't suppose he was a great speaker. But he had fire in his heart. And he had a backbone of steel. He had a desire to see something happen. And you know something? People will follow a leader who is inspiring and who is determined. They may not be perfect. They probably no, no doubt aren't perfect. They have their flaws. They, have their, they make their mistakes, their blunders. But if their heart is right, if they're sincere, people will follow them. And so I, I urge you as a father to demonstrate to your children that whatever your weaknesses may be, you're sincere. You want to do something positive in their lives. He says, come, let us build. I have to come back today to one of my favorite sayings. I have written it in my Bible, and I often refer to it. <coughs> it's written by a man named Everett Hale, and I think I can remember it by heart. I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I should do. And what I should do, by the grace of God, I will do. Could you adopt that motto today? You are one. You say, I'm only one, but you are one. Well, I can't do everything. No, but you can do something. You can write a letter. You can spend some time in prayer. You can volunteer to help in vacation Bible school. When there's a job in the church, you can say, I'm not depending on someone else to do it. I'll do it. It's a matter, my friend, of commitment. Now... Nehemiah set about to organize a working party. He was a pretty good organizer. He obviously had some skills in administration. And I want you to look at a verse here over in chapter 4. I like this. He set about to organize builders. I don't know that he ever had any experience in this whole realm of building, but he went to work and he said, to the people, let's build. And then in chapter 4, verse 6, it says, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Four-letter word. Now, we know there are four-letter words that we don't use. 
Although, unfortunately, we hear them more than we would like. But here is an unpopular word that's four letters that we need to be using. And I'll tell you something that I'm, I'm convinced of. As I've watched churches and as I've watched communities and as I've watched uh, our nation uh, for the many years that I have observed it, sometimes success just boils down to perspiration. Somebody has to be willing to do, to take time, to take energy. Nehemiah had prayed, and prayer is wonderful. Prayer is necessary, but we can't stop with praying. We've got to do as well. I think that I'll get you folk to say this with me. It won't hurt you. In case you don't have the same translation of the Bible that I do, which is this New King James Version. It's not the only good translation. It happened, happened to be the one I use. But here it says, For the people had a mind to work. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's eight words. For the people had a mind to work. Now let's say that together. Here we go. For the people had a mind to work. Now you folk work. Many of you were out in the yard yesterday mowing grass, planting flowers, painting perhaps. Well, we need people to work in the kingdom of God. This four-letter word, work. Now, the third thing I want to say is not only did Nehemiah worry and work, but he also witnessed. Now, as I look at all that happened in the book of Nehemiah, obviously we could preach a series of sermons on Nehemiah. But as we could expect, there were people standing in his way. Whenever you try to do something right for God, expect people to stand in your way. And maybe the very people you think should be encouraging you won't. They'll criticize you. They'll accuse you of false motives. They say you're filled with pride, whatever. Well, there were enemies of God in the land who were grieved at what was happening. Look in chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat, I guess these were the ancient counterparts to Al-Qaeda or whatever. They were just bad characters. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. These were the devil's servants. These were the enemies of God. These were the people inspired to stop, to hinder, to thwart, if you will, progress. Yes, they were grieved. George Whitfield, the famous English evangelist, was preaching in New England. And he was not popular because he was scolding many religionists of his day. Even the clergy. Back before the first great awakening, a lot of the preachers were drunks and were more interested in gambling than they were studying the Bible. But anyway, he came into town and one of the prominent preachers said to him, I'm sorry to see you, Mr. Whitfield. And he said, so is the devil. There are going to be people grieved when you start building for God. They cried, tried to create a distraction by making false accusations. They said, you want to be a king. We know what you're up to. Chapter 6, verse 2. Here's what he said to them. I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Now I want to tell you something. If you're involved in the work of Jesus, you're doing a great work. Don't let anybody kid you. 
when you're teaching vacation Bible school, when you're teaching in Sunday school, when you're singing in a choir, when you're uh, working around the church, planning, uh, helping, doing. It's a great work. It's the greatest work there is. They said down in verse 6, they had someone sent, uh, Sanballat sent to, to Nehemiah and said, uh, it's reported among the nations. And Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you're rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. Nehemiah, you're ambitious. We know why you're here. You're rebuilding these walls so you can sit on the throne of Jerusalem, put a crown on your head and a purple robe, and we're going to be your subjects. We know what you're up to. You're full of pride. It was a big lie. Nehemiah had a comfortable job back in Persia. But he refused to turn back because of criticism. He would not let the carping critics dissuade him. He knew it wasn't true. God knew it wasn't true. And so he pressed on with his work. And bless your heart, according to chapter 6, verse 15, in 52 days, in 52 days, the wall was built. Now, I have one other point to make, and I'll just touch briefly on this, because this involves Ezra the scribe. Number four, they worshipped. After they got all the walls built, after they got the gates set up, after this was all done, and they had the physical facilities ready, Guess what happened? They had a revival. And it started with the word. Chapter 8, we find how Ezra, the scribe, took the book of the law. And what did he do with it? Well, look in chapter 8, verse 8. Nehemiah, or Ezra, and these other leaders the preachers, prophets, whatever. Bless the Lord, and it says in verse 8, this is chapter 8, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Isn't that precious? This is real Bible exposition here. This is what revival is. This is what Reformation's all about. This is what promotes change. What makes, what makes change in our lives, what makes change in our families, what makes change in the church and in the nation is the truth of God, folk. It's just that simple. All of our schemes, all of our programs will go to naught unless we get back to the book. So they read distinctly from the law of God, it says in chapter 8, verse 8, and they gave the sense, explained it, and helped the people to understand it. And then there was joy, praise, and they began to keep the ordinances of the Lord. You have a Bible. I have a Bible. The Lord gave the Bible. The Holy Spirit inspired it. Now let's get into it. Let's read it. Let's find out what God wants us to do. And let's hear it. And let's obey it. And then we'll have reformation. Then we'll build the church. Then we'll build the kingdom. Oh, may the Lord give us men like Nehemiah with the courage to leave the comfort zone. And women like Nehemiah that'll step out and do that which is risky. Face the opposition. Face discouragement in the name of the Lord.